a lot of thoughts about this sermon, and I've moved through a lot of different emotions, so we'll see what happens this morning. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, source of all that is and that shall be, we thank you for this day, for this time to be together to discern what your call might be us might be for us in this particular season of our common life. We ask that your still speaking voice and still moving spirit might accompany us on this journey in the days ahead. And in our time together this morning, may the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So something very interesting about Christianity today, and this has been the case for a significant part of our history, is the association of the strength of our faith with the center of political power. This is despite so much of the redemptive work that Christ calls us towards being against that exact kind of power. And yet the dominant narrative in media about Christianity right now is the position that Christians, and only certain kinds of Christians, should be installed at every level and office of government. There are others who go further and believe that Christians should exercise control or dominion over every aspect of culture, and that biblical law, subjectively selected, to be sure, should be used as the basis for a reorganization of civil society. I'm going to pause just for a second so our folks in the sound booth, there's a ringing echo um, that's a bit awkward for me to try to speak through. I, I don't intend to devote much attention to those theologies this morning, but I will be very clear in saying that I reject them, because I recognize that this faith was formed as a part of resistance to empire, that Christ was crucified in the name of justice under that empire. Because of those two things, I cannot submit to the idea that this faith should then lead empires. Something real and deep was lost, I think, about this faith and its movement from being a religion of outcasts and folks on the margin to becoming the center of the Roman Empire. But to go deeply into that would be a different sermon series altogether. We are here today to engage with faith and democracy, an election sermon and service as it were. It's funny, I think I noted in the EDU's note this past week that the first election sermon was offered in 1634. It was a call for the Massachusetts General Court, which was the legislature <clears throat> of that colony at the time, to re-elect the Commonwealth's governor. That minister spoke for almost an hour, telling people what he thought and why, what Christ would ask for the Commonwealth to do. The members of the General Court heard all of that and then promptly voted to elect someone different. <laughs> and yet, the election sermon became a standard part of New England colonial and state politics. The general focus of these sermons make it clear how adaptable they had to be. In the early, the late 1600s, they defend the crown and monarchy. They then become deeply anti-Catholic. And then they eventually arrive at a point where they marry together the teachings of Christ and the virtue of a democratic republic. And while almost all forms of government like to lay claim to divine ordinance, we should be careful to note that none of this is preordained. That neither the Bible, nor God, nor Jesus, none of them tell us what form of government might actually be best for civil society. More to that point, democracy is an historic anomaly. In almost every single case, when a society has been formed, it's might that has made right, force of arms that has determined the course of law. Subjugation and violent repression were the norm. Even right now, in 2024, of the 170 some odd countries in the world, more than 40% of them are autocracies. Of the world's 40% of countries that are democracies, the vast majority, including our own, are considered to be flawed. 
After the experience that our founding fathers had under a monarchy, they move forward with the idea that some of the governed should have a say in government. So here we are, in the midst of yet another election season, wondering what our faith might have to offer to us in this time. The Beatitudes called out for this particular Sunday. It's the first time that we get to encounter the disciples as the disciples. Until this moment, they have never been called the disciples in the gospel. It's also a moment where Christ draws a few red lines. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Dr. Jillian Englehart, a scholar of the book of Matthew, encourages us to understand righteousness as it is used here to be the same way it was understood in the Hebrew Bible, particularly in the book of Isaiah, as a total societal restructuring. So perhaps it, this verse could be more fully read as, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for a more just world for all. And if we accept that reading in verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, well, that verse becomes, blessed are those who are persecuted because of their belief in and work towards a more just world for all. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For just a moment, I want to invite you to imagine a church that engages the world like that, that blesses those who seek justice, that blesses those who call for equity, that says, yes, indeed, you may face some sort of penalty or consequence for the work that you are doing, and yet, it is still work that you need to do. Later on, when Christ says the meek will inherit the earth, he doesn't mean the quiet and gentle who don't challenge the status quo. He means those persons who suffer under abuse and injustice. He means those who exist outside the halls of power, just beyond the margins of what we often consider to be acceptable, whose rights and life are trampled upon those who have more power, more privilege, more authority in this world. The example of Christ is a constant reminder that we are called to be seekers of truth and justice who look with the eyes of the powerless and suffering people, so that we might better understand and respond to that which is wrong and must be made right in the world. As always, I'll tell you a story. There's a guy on my bus route. He's an older man. He's a veteran, and he spends hours every other day at the VA hospital. I'm always on the bus before him and on the bus after him, so I see him get on and get off, and he always struggles because he's got this wheelchair he has to physically move, and he also has these two massive duffel bags. Now, for almost a year, I wondered where he went when he got up on the bus and where he came from to get on the bus, because his stop isn't close to much housing, and I couldn't imagine him trying to move through Atlanta's horrible sidewalks with his wheelchair and these two big duffel bags. So imagine my surprise one rainy afternoon when I saw him. Duffel bags on his lap sleeping under the awning of a FedEx store. An older gentleman, a veteran, sleeping under the awning of a store. This is just down the road from where we are right now. I imagine that our answers about what is wrong in the world might be different. And both Christ and the theology of liberation call upon us to give preferential treatment to his observations, not mine. Preference for the observations of the powerless, the poor, the oppressed, and the dispossessed. Preference for those who are outside the margin. Preference for what they might mean to live a dignified life. This is the union of faith and democracy. What does our faith call us to do? And within that system, what are we willing to do to give up, to change, such that the arc of righteousness might bend and touch this side of heaven? That's faith. What about democracy? Let us first be clear in saying that democracy is not just about voting. There are people all over the world who get to vote. In some places, you walk into a polling station, you mark your ballot, you go home, and then the news reports that your six-term president's been re-elected with 98% of the vote. And the leader of the opposition is going to prison for election irregularities. That is voting. That is not democracy. 
Democracy is more than that. It's also protest, petition, negotiation, it's agitation, it's fighting for a better world. We live in a world that is not much unlike previous eras. There are wide gaps between the haves and the have-nots. War rages and peace seems to be a fleeting idea. We pray for a lot of things, <clears throat> but it doesn't always seem to make a tangible difference. For example, I can pray for the poor mother dying from a disease that could be treated, or at least better managed with adequate health care that she could also afford. Prayer is helpful in that circumstance, but her ability to access the right care at a price that she can actually pay, that's unfortunately a political question. Our faith is clear on what must happen here, but in a democracy, it's going to take a little bit more than that. I pray each day for the safety of trans children, that they might have access to all the care that they might need when they need it. I know what my faith says about that, and yet that too has become a political question. A question for legislatures and judges to work out while we kind of find our way. This is true for a whole host of things. I think you can imagine all the things right now that you could pray for, that you hope might be different, hope might be better, and yet I believe that prayer works, but it's often not enough, not for things that seem to just stick. Prayer doesn't do very much for the person under the awning of the FedEx store. It doesn't do very much for the single mother that can't afford food for her children. Those are policy questions. Those are decisions that people make. They walk into halls of power every single day in this city, in this state, in this country, and they decide, here's what we're going to do or not do about that. I think Fox said it best. When our faith and what we're asked to do by others are incompatible, we should follow our faith. It's straightforward. It's actually pretty clear. It's actually pretty easy. I acknowledge that all of this is difficult for us, but I think here's the reality. What we do here in this country is different. It always has been. Our founders called upon us to be a more perfect union, and imperfect as it has been, the building of that vision is, has been and will continue to be a trial by fire and refire. I told you earlier that the Economist's Democracy Index has placed the U.S. as a flawed democracy. That's been the case since 2016. But almost all that is due to our political culture. Millions of Americans on all parts of the spectrum have lost faith in this particular process <clears throat> as a means for the world that they wish to build. And so in the battle for our better angels, let us remember <clears throat> that millions more people deeply believed in the promise of this system, that this might work, even when they were being denied access to it. We see that in the tens of thousands of white, non-landowning men who rushed to register to vote when they were given the chance. It's understood in the registration of black men, newly freed from enslavement, who not only registered to vote, but also ran for and were elected to office. It's seen in the witness of women who stood outside the White House gates for a year, demanding that Woodrow Wilson support women's suffrage. Men, women, and children marched on Washington. They rode buses to the segregated North and South. They endured brutal assaults for simply walking across the bridge. Thousands of people have lost their lives fighting in this country against their fellow citizens. Not just the Civil War, but in all the time since, people have risked their lives for what we do here. Because their only demand is that we might live up to our highest ideals, that in this country, every single one of us can belong. That all of us be given, as reasonably we might, a voice in how things work here. I'm not going to pretend that God necessarily ordains that kind of system. But I do think there's a reason that system and our denomination have chosen the idea that we all get a say to be how we do things. Because we understand that within all of that back and forth, all that agitation, 
petition and protest negotiation, somewhere in that we emerge better than we were when we started the journey. That somewhere in that we find our better angels, we reach a higher plane, a greater potential, and we decide that for a moment we're going to actually do the things that we've set out to do. I'll tell you that polling sentiment over the past decade has shown increasing distrust, the entrenchment of polarization, and right now more than a few elected officials are openly calling upon us to reject this system, to distrust our neighbors, to look down upon them who vote for the candidate who we don't necessarily agree with. Millions of people willing to take everything this country has been and might become to tear it apart because their vision is something different. And a lot of the people with those positions are Christians too. One of the reasons why I felt so confident and convicted that we should have a service like this is because for the past year, a lot of ministers have been sitting in pulpits like this sharing some different messages, but often to their congregations the idea that God's ordaining that which they want to do, that which again might supplant democracy for political positions might replace their faith with political, partisan platforms. That's happening right now in this country, all over the place, even here in Georgia. It's hard. Because we enter this season with apprehension, anxiety, I think some of us with joy and hope, all that held together by the invisible spring of faith in a better world. I will tell you that on a personal note, I spent the past two weeks literally crisscrossing the country. The first half was for my vacation uh, on an Amtrak journey. In California, I had food harvested by immigrant farm workers. In Washington, I dined with tourists from Australia. Somewhere in Minnesota, I enjoyed conversations with a professor from Indiana. I weaved through small towns in Montana and oil fields in North Dakota. I wandered the riverfront of Chicago explored for the upteenth time the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis. I spent several days in conversation with 13 other young clergy in the UCC. And through all of that, I became more convinced of my own hope for what's possible in this world, what's possible because of our faith and this system. For what we can accomplish when we dare to ask the question, what am I willing to do? What am I willing to give up? so that I may more fully follow Christ, so that this side of heaven might look more like the one above. We exist in the awkward tension between the already and the not yet, the promised but not fulfilled, with great hope and deep patience. In the mixing of our faith and democracy, we find ourselves in a place that says, not me, but we, not I, but us, not a party, nor a politician, but a vision that God and Christ have laid out before us a world where every aspect of creation flourishes in dignity, a more just world for all. All in this together, standing at the foot of the cross, bearing witness to the unthinkable, and yet still believing, still hoping against hope, that injustice will be made right, that an equity will be overturned, and that all of us might arrive together at that bright new horizon where the earth and heaven might sing a new song. What are we supposed to take away from this? I think the big thing, and this is important for progressive Christians, inclusive Christians, welcoming Christians, whatever you might want to call yourself this day, it's important because oftentimes I think that we like to pretend that we've surpassed the need to include faith in Christ's teachings and the way we actually live our lives. I, I say that aware that you're sitting here this morning but I've also talked to many of you, and I know that sometimes you like to live in a world that's almost post-Jesus, almost post-Bible, almost post-teachings and thoughts of our traditions. It's easy to look at those other Christians and say, well, see, they rely too much on Jesus, too much on the Bible. I don't want to be like them, so we run away from all of that. And then just sort of show up and talk about politics, but leave out theology. It is okay for your faith to be a guide in how you choose to vote. The danger and the prayer here for you this morning is that you don't supplant or replace the teachings of this faith with the platform of a political party 
or the speeches of a particular politician, even if you really, really like them. The idea here is not that you allow Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Green, Communist, whomever's in between to replace the teachings, the work of Christ. Sure, there may be comparisons you can make between what politicians say and what Christ and other prophets offered us, but Christ and the prophets came first, and they should in this system again. Our faith and Christ's kingdom are not of this world, but they certainly are concerned with it. You will be hard-pressed to find someone who 100% aligns with the teachings of Christ. That's the reality of being on this side of heaven. So get as close as you can. I'll close with one more thing. During our closing worship at the Next Generation Leadership Initiatives orientation this past week, uh, we were entering communion, and one of my peers began the words of institution by saying, a bunch of guys were in a room. And I chuckled at how nonchalant it seemed when she said it. Now, that's a big part of the story. Because it's always been just a bunch of guys. A bunch of guys who have the audacity to believe that God has called them to be a part of the story and the arc of redemption. When the going gets tough here on earth, we have this, this habit of looking towards the heavens as though a superhero or a saint will descend from above and solve everything on our behalf. I imagine the saints and all the folks in heaven see us looking up and they wonder, why do they spend all their time looking up here? Don't they know that they are the bunch of guys now? The bunch of people whom God has called to be a part of their unending story. <clears throat> I think the question for this moment where our faith and democracy merge together is do we have the audacity to believe that God has called us to be a part of building a more just world? for all? Do we have the courage to say yes to that call, fully unaware of what all that might mean and bring us towards? Are we willing to let go of pride, let go of ego, let go of possession and power if it means that even one other person might be lifted up and might experience a more dignified life? Will we allow ourselves to be humble enough to view the world through the lens of the poor and the powerless? I think we have to. We have to say yes to that call. We have to adopt that lens of humility because on this side of heaven, there is still so much more work to do because the one who walked before us and showed us a better way has given us pretty clear guidelines of how we might live in a better world, how we might organize a more just and fair society. And our job on this side of heaven is to do on earth exactly what already exists in heaven. And so if we are to have a government, let it be democratic in form, precisely because that's the government that we've got, and it's the form that people have fought and died, invested their whole heart and soul into being because of their belief that this process a protest, petition, agitation, negotiation, and yes, indeed, voting too, that this process might help us all build a more just world for all. That all the policies and procedures that we might debate in the public arena, that that does attach to something that might happen here after life. That this system of government is worth it. Because out of all the ways that we might make earth more like heaven, Democracy might be the best shot we've got, the best hope we've got to have a bunch of people, oddballs and outcasts, gathered in a room, just like this one, in the schoolhouse, in the public square, all engaging in conversation, all engaging in debate, all striving to build, meet, rise to the vision that's been laid out before us so long ago. I'll be honest with you, and there's a, some slippage here that I still wrestle with because of my research and work in Christian nationalism. But I really do believe that there is something special about this particular country. I believe there's something special about our particular form and style of government. I believe there's something special about the idea that even though we didn't quite know what we were doing, the founding leaders of this country, they said we're gonna build a more perfect union. There's something deep, beautiful, and meaningful in that. 
And because I've seen the journey of Christ before all of that, I believe that a more perfect union really is possible. Because I watched Christ, I read about Christ walking this earth, living a human life, enduring trial and tribulation, humiliation, and also still coming out on the other side, not dead, but fully and freely alive. And because I believe that that's Christ's great hope for us, that happens to also be my great hope for this country. That we might find ourselves in a place where all of us can be more fully, more freely alive. So my prayers for you this day are that when you choose to engage in the process of democracy, whether that's protest or petition, standing in line to vote, registering to vote, my prayer is that you will be safe. My prayer is that you will act with courage, the courage of your convictions, the guidance of your faith. My prayer is that you will call upon other people to do something similar. Again, because we're a flawed democracy because people don't believe in this system. So it takes us believing in it and saying, being almost evangelical in a sense to say, yes, indeed, this really does work. Maybe not the first time, maybe not the second, but over and over and over again, this is not a one and done thing. It's a constant, frequent, unending battle to see if we will do what we've been called to do. If we will rise to meet our better angels. It's not unlike work that Christ calls us towards. And again, because Christ called us towards that first, I have greater faith in what we can do here and now. May all these prayers and those that remain quietly in your hearts as well be so. Amen. Thank you.